That is something we feel about Jesus when it is well. And if it's not well, we go to Jesus. The only name, the only person that we can go to, if you stand and we're going to sing about Jesus right now, he is the only name. Jesus. One, two, three, four. Please rise with us. Only name that matters to me The only one whose favor I see Only name that matters to me Yours will be Friendship and affection I need To feel my father smiling on me Only name that matters to me and yours is the name, the name that saved me. Power and grace, power forgave me. Your love is all I've ever needed. Yours will be the only name that matters to me. The only one whose favor I see. Only one that matters to me. And yours is the name, the name that saved me. Mercy and grace, the power that forgave me. And your love is all I've ever needed. When I wake up in the land of glory, with the saints I will tell my story. There will be one day that I proclaim. Amen. When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one day that I proclaim La 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 When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name I proclaim When I wake up in the land of glory With the saints I will tell my story There will be one name that I proclaim Sing those loud eyes, come on La 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 One more time La 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 Amen. So that first one we sang, How We Felt, It Is Well. And we sang about Jesus, the only name, right? And now we're going to sing just sing to Jesus. <laughs> we will sing, sing, sing. Make music with the heavens We will sing, sing, sing Grateful that you hear us When we shout your praise Lift up the name of 
Jesus, the only name, the one way, right? John 14, 6. Jesus said unto him, Thomas, Thomas was doubting right then. I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. There's only one way.
shouting to the Lord right now, but how many real things make us want to shout, you know, like a first down, a new puppy, a tetanus shot, chemo, chemo makes us want to shout, unexpected things, unexpected gifts. Sometimes out of embarrassment, we don't shout out to the Lord in front of somebody else because of social acceptance or something. We do it here. Let's do it everywhere, you know? We, we need to give each other the strength, and that's what we... we we're up here, we're worshiping God. You're worshiping God with us. We go out there and worship God. They can worship God with us too, right? Amen. So Psalm 98, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Burst into jubilant song with music. Make music to the Lord with harp, with drum, with sound of singing, with trumpets, the blast of the ram's horn. Shout to joy before the Lord, our King.
listen to songs on the Christian radio station and we're just singing a song, but we're really worshiping. You, you, you got to give it to these guys that write the songs. Unfortunately, we're not songwriters up here, but like this one's by Fee. I think we all know Fee, but every single line of the song that we're going to sing is a verse from the Bible. I'm, just, I'm not going to give you every line, but our Father Creator, Deuteronomy 32.6, you hold our hearts together, Colossians 1.17. There's no one higher than you, Philippians 2, 9, Psalm 78, Jeremiah 10, Philippians, Matthew 28, 1 John, John, Psalms, Nehemiah, he's new and old, Philemon, Psalms, Exodus, Revelation, you reign with love forever, right? He's, he's, every single line of the song is a different verse from the word. So also when we have trouble out there shouting the Lord with people, you know, we can just go, oh, that, that was from the word. I can tell you that. Well, let's look it up together. You know, there's ways that we can do that. Right now we're going to do it in song. No 
Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving us Jesus Christ, your son, to take our burdens, our sins. If we only kneel at the cross and give them to him, he can be our best friends. We can tell others that too. We want everybody to know Jesus. That's why we're here today. Thank you so much for this congregation, for this free place to pray. And just let Pastor Eddie's words flow from the Holy Spirit. Lord, I know the Holy Spirit's here today. Hallelujah. Amen. Awesome. Amen. I hope you feel it's hot in here. I mean, I feel like the fire of God, man. It's just like awesome. Isn't that awesome? I tell you, it's just absolutely awesome. We're going to talk a little bit about that. But listen, do me a favor. Turn around. Greet someone. Say hello. Make a friend. Invite somebody out for lunch. It'll probably be the best decision you ever made. you guys are. Woo! Oh, man. Well, listen, if you're in middle school to high school, middle school to high school, you can just stand up. They're heading out to their classes, middle school, high school, my right, your left. And uh, I tell you, those, uh, those teens, they end up, they went to a winter jam yesterday. They're out there all day. Woo! I tell you. I saw them jumping. I saw videos. They were screaming for Jesus, man. It was, out, it was outrageous. I'm like, they got to bring some of that fire back over here. <laughs> I tell you, ain't nothing more wonderful than seeing. Yes. Woo! There goes a favor of God. Isn't that awesome? I tell you. Well, listen, um, last week we. We began to pursue something that we really have never done in the history of New Hope. And uh, I had I'd spoken to the staff last week, uh, actually, yeah, Monday, in our staff meeting, and I said, listen, I can't thank you guys enough for everything that you have done, all our leaders, because last year, 2015, was absolutely phenomenal year for us. I mean, it, it, it was, I wish I could spend all day, we're going to hand out reports uh, you'll probably get an email. All of our members are getting them uh, hand-delivered. 
uh, because of our budget and some other stuff that needs to be voted on. But besides that, I'm telling you, just a phenomenal year. But this is, this is what the Lord pressed on my heart. And I told him, I said, listen, even though we had a phenomenal year last year, even though you guys did a great job, what we did last year will not work for 2016. And the reason, be, I'll tell you, the reason why is because in the next 12 to 13 months, we're in the process of launching two other congregations here. We're going to launch a Spanish congregation with Ted and Karen. Just raise your hand. And they're going to be leading a team and a group. And uh, it's going to be phenomenal, uh, as well as uh, Mike. I don't know if I see Mike here. Homesick. Home screaming for Jesus last night. Winter jam. He threw out himself. Got you. <laughs> and uh, anyway, so, so Mike is right now raising a team, and we're planning on launching another campus uh, next year, February 2017, into Venice, South Venice. And so everything, God said, so we got to bring this to a whole nother level. And, uh, and so we realized that we needed to pursue God's presence more and more, and more intently, more purposely, and uh, we know that it's going to take a miracle. There isn't, there isn't an Alliance Church in our district that has planted two churches within a year. All right, I mean, it's, it's an insane task, and I have no idea why God would do that. But anyway, so, but he, he's in the business of doing the miraculous. It's impossible for us, but it is impossible for us, but it's possible for him. Amen? So in light of that, we started our boiler rooms, and uh, I can't tell you, it has been phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. From last week to this week, I tell you, it has been absolutely fantastic. And um, I don't, there, there should be an insert in the weekend program uh, for the boiler room. But uh, pretty much what we do is we, it's a pre-service uh, prayer gathering. And it's based on, if anyone ever heard of Charles Spurgeon, anybody ever heard of Charles Spurgeon? Charles Spurgeon was, uh, it was said of him to be the, the greatest preacher of the 19th century. Uh, he preached to hundreds of thousands of people. He led tens of thousands to the Lord. Because of, because of Charles Spurgeon being a catalytic leader, he uh, was able uh, to lead, uh, be a catalyst in many revivals, not only in England, uh, but also here in the Americas. And so they had asked him and said, listen, what is, what is the key to your success? And he goes, well, I'll show you. You're going to show us? He goes, Yeah. And so upstairs, there was a couple thousand people waiting to hear him preach. And he takes them downstairs into the basement, into this huge boiler room, this dirty, filthy boiler room with coal. And in there were 700 people who were praying, praying for him, praying for the people upstairs, that they would feel the presence of God, that they would be, that they would be a great movement of the Spirit, that there'd be a great revival in people's heart, that hearts would be broken, marriages would be saved, that people would be be just slain by God in such a supernatural way, and God moved miraculously. And so we knew, taking it to another level, and he said, these people, these saints here who are laboring before God is the key. That when you go before God, you become a people of God's presence. God's presence falls, and he desires to be with his people. And uh, so I tell you, uh, we had about 20 people there this morning, I think that's why you're seeing the, the fire in the room here, because we've been praying for you and your family. Uh, we've been praying for all the other churches in town, because there's only one church in the city. You know that, right? One church. Regardless of whatever tribe or affiliation you come from, there's one church. We serve one God, one Father, one baptism, one Holy Spirit. That is all, one. And so uh, we're in unity with the body of Christ, and I pray that you would begin to see God move in mighty and powerful ways. And we're going to talk more about that. And uh, that's awesome. So listen, quickly do me a favor. Take out this weekend program. And I'm just going to hit a few things. There's been some slides in the back. Uh, it's awesome. There's great information here about all the things going on. But a bulk of our communication is done online, Facebook, website, email. And so if you haven't got an email from me to this week, okay, I probably sent out two. If you haven't got one, that means you're not on our list. And I can't encourage you enough, whether you're a first-time guest, returning guest, or one of our regulars here, please, please, please take a moment. There's pens right in front of you in the pocket. Uh, we just want all our first-time guests and returning guests to know that, listen, we're here for you. We want you to come and experience a wonderful, powerful, life-transforming uh, moment with God. And all of this has been done so that you would be able to hear him clearly and see him in great ways. And so... There's opportunities there to serve and opportunities for you to get involved. Let me just say that uh, 
Uh, this afternoon, I'm having a barbecue at my house, and you guys are all invited. Every single one. And you're going to go, there's no way you're going to fit. <laughs> I mean, God does miraculous things. It's amazing. Okay, we've had up to 90 people in the house. And uh, you're going to say, well, how is that possible? Come and see. Come and see. So it's going to be awesome, especially, uh, especially if you've never been to one. Please make an effort. Come, meet some friends, uh, connect with some other first-timers, uh, not only first-time guests, but uh, some of our, our newer, if you've been here less than, uh, less than a month or so and you haven't really been able to connect, just come to my home. It would be a great time. So uh, let me just say one last thing on the, the pink connection card. Prayer request. Listen, we want you to fill this on the back of this connection card prayer request because we want to come alongside you. Uh, we want you to be able to know that we're here for you. And uh, fill that out. Put it in any one of those offering boxes. And uh, every Monday night, I and your other leaders and pastors here, we pray over every single one of these requests. And then after we pray and labor over them, we hand them to our prayer warriors and intercessors, and they pray. And what we've been seeing is God answers prayer. Amen. God's alive, he's real, and he's concerned about the things in your life, and he answers prayer. And so uh, I challenge you to test God in that. Here, go ahead. Write it down and see if God is not able to meet your needs according to his riches and glory. Amen? All right, well, thank you. Where are my little ones? Come on, guys. Woo-hoo. What's up, buddy? What's up? Good job. Wow. Praise the Lord. Come on. Hey, buddy. Good job. Woo. All right. Awesome. My Lord, I tell you, just love children. Kids have a wonderful way of speaking the raw truth, isn't it? Uh, when we get to be adults, we've learned how to deflect and move and kind of shuffle a little bit. And kids just come and they they just love being kids. And so we, we, we're grateful for kids. If you're here at New Hope for more than a few weeks, you're going to find out we love children and that we want them to have a wonderful experience here at New Hope. Our goal and our desire is that there would be wonderful places for them to grow and learn about Jesus. We thank you all the parents. We thank all, the, uh, all our volunteers for our youth and our children that prepare lessons all week long uh, to invest in these children, the gospel of Jesus Christ, that they would grow and to be strong men and women of God who are going to shake their generation and their culture for the glory of God. Amen? And so uh, I just want, we want to pray for them. And so Jesus loved to invite the little ones forward. That's kind of why we invite them forward. Jesus said, bring the little ones. Sometimes us as disciples get in the way, and he loved to touch them and pray for them. And so symbolically, we extend our hands as a symbol of touching the children as Jesus would do and pray God's blessing on the Father. Thank you, Lord, for these children. Thank you, what a gift they are. Thank you for their parents. Thank you, Lord, for, Father, all our servant leaders and volunteers that, Father, just go to, Make so much effort to train and come alongside these children and our families. Father, bless them. We pray, Father, what all they learn today will be deep seeds that would glorify you. And we give you all the glory and all the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. Awesome. See, the gospel of grace, this radical, unconventional grace, is what turned the world upside down in the first century and what continues to turn the world upside down in all languages, cultures, and societies. But I think we've kind of tamed it. We've kind of almost taken away the power. We've taken it away, and it's just kind of a hollow shell of what it once used to be. But when you look at Christianity, and you really look and you read the scriptures, you read Acts, you read the gospels, and you read the writings of Paul, you see that it was actually not just different from 
other world religions, but it was almost polar opposite. It almost did a 180 degree turn on what most people thought religion was. Now, most people, if you ask them what religion is, they'll say something to the extent of it's about what you have to do to get to God, or it's what you have to do, or what morality you have to attain to to get to heaven, or something of that nature. But when you read the scriptures, that's really polar opposite from the narrative of the scripture. We say religion is all about what you need to do to get to God. You have to eat this way, pray this way, act this way, and then maybe at the end of time, it's usually a gamble, but he might let you in to heaven. But when you read the scriptures, you see that Jesus is actually on a pursuit towards us. It's not about us coming to him, but it's about him coming to us. All right. Well, listen, let's, uh, let's pause and begin by inviting the Holy Spirit to come to teach us what he would want us to learn through the ancient truths of the Bible. Amen. Let's uh, bow our heads and pray. Lord, what a sacred privilege it is to gather before the presence of a holy, perfect, and righteous God. And so we cry out, Lord, for your mercy. We cry out, God, for your grace. And we ask, Lord, forgive us, Lord, because our hearts and our thoughts are so preoccupied with stuff and things that we think are so important for us to accomplish and to do that we have made no room for you, for your son, Jesus. And so, Father, we ask, Lord, Lord, give us the power, renew our minds and our hearts so that we would not put anything else in this life of more value than you. And we ask this all. In your son's precious and powerful name, amen. amen. Jesus' birth remains the greatest miracle of all time. And because of Jesus' birth, the early Christian community, they sought out and they began with great fervor to support Widows, orphans, and the needy. They, they even built, staffed, and paid for hospitals to care for the sick, the dying, and the disabled. Christ's followers have founded almost every major charitable organization on the planet, like the Red Cross, Salvation Army, Catholic Charities, World Vision, World Relief, Samaritan's Purse, Food for the Hungry, Compassion International, etc., 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 goes on the list. Not only that, but Jesus' birth also impacted education. As almost every one of the first 123 American colleges and universities were founded by Christ's followers. But today, there are just too many of us who still make no room for Jesus in our life and in our circumstances. And for this reason is why we are continuing our study to unpack the Gospel of Luke called I Believe which will investigate the claims of a man who says that he is God and discover how believing will radically redefine and reshape who we are and how we live. So as we examine today's scriptures, let's explore the deeper joy that Jesus' birth produces in us. Why? Because Jesus is greater than religion. Think about it this way. Religion says, do it. Jesus says, it is done. Religion says, God will love you if you change. Jesus says, my love changes you. And so I believe that this is best understood when you and I consider how the noise and the busyness of life numbs us 
from having a greater, more sacred and holier view of God in our personal experiences and in our circumstances. And so this reminds us how God had to send His Son so that you and I can see and experience life from heaven's perspective. See, without Jesus, all we would have is a worldly perspective. So why is Jesus' birth so important? What I want to suggest to you is simply because it shows us how God makes time to be with you and me. I want, you, I want you to hear that, okay? God makes time to be with you and with me. When you think of the, of the God of the universe, the creator of all things, and then you think of little Eddie, who in the world is Eddie that God would want to spend any time with me? But his birth proves it with the honest shadow of a doubt. And I think it's very, very important. We're going to see three ways in how Jesus makes time, God Almighty comes to make time to be with you and me. And we're going to see how his birth does that. And there's three areas that we're going to look at as we go into the text today in Luke chapter 2. First one is that Jesus came to make room for the despised. Second is that Jesus came to make room for the poor. And third, Jesus came to make room for the lost. And there isn't any one of us in this room that doesn't fit one of those categories if we don't fit all three. And uh, we're going to talk about that. So turn with me to Luke chapter 3, and uh, we're going to unpack that uh, through the Scriptures and uh, see why it's absolutely so significant, why it is a core doctrinal belief for all of us who call ourselves disciples and Christ followers, the birth of Christ. Uh, let's read uh, Luke chapter 2. We're just going to read the first seven verses. And it says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went out from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to a firstborn son. She wrapped him in clothes and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. All right. I know, I, I don't have time to go back to our first message, but see, this is probably one of the areas that most of the unbelieving world goes after. Come on, you know, God coming and being born in a baby. I mean, that's just kind of a story. It's a fable. You know what I mean, it, it's not really true. There's no evidence of it. And the first thing they do is they attack the validity of the scriptures. And so when we kicked off this series, the first thing we addressed out of Luke, we went after and said, okay, listen, is this book true? Is this book trustworthy? Can we go to this book, and not just pieces of it being right, that the entire book to be right? Is there any validity to it? Because if it isn't, we're totally wasting our time here. You're wasting your time if you absolutely don't think that there's any validity to this book. And then we looked at, not just from a, you know, well, you know, we're hostages, and we just stick our head in the mud and just say, well, we're supposed to. No, we looked at the, we looked at, the scientific evidence, we looked at the archaeological evidence, we looked at the evidence and how they prove ancient documents to be authentic or not authentic, carbon dating and testing. We went all through that in the first, first week. And so if you weren't here for that weekend, I can encourage you to go on the website. You can see the sermon online, and then you come to your own conclusions. Don't believe me because I say so. You go to your own conclusions, you follow the evidence, and see where the evidence takes you. That's the most important thing. You don't want to hear from somebody else. Don't listen to hearsay. Follow the evidence yourself. 
My goal, my heart here is to point you in a direction, and hopefully you will discover it. But uh, if you come here and you don't know the word, how do you know what I'm telling you is the truth? The Bible says test the spirit. Very, very important. Now, I don't mind you sending me all the emails and letters, and uh, oh, I have a file full of, it, full of my fan mail. It's okay. All right, so <laughs> we're going to see three groups of people right here in this first seven verses. I think Luke does a great job. Three groups of people, and I believe why Jesus came to make room for. Because you and I have a tendency not to make room for them. Our humanity doesn't make room for them. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the first verse. It says, in those days, Caesar Augustus, and then if you jump down to verse 2, there's Quirinius, who was the governor of Caesar. And so he, he oversourced. Now, you've got to understand that these two guys were the most despised people, okay? Caesar and all of his governors subjugated the world, the known world at that time. There wasn't any culture that despised them, except their own, of course. They felt they were superior. They felt that they were better. They're going to go there, and they're going to make the whole world Rome. And now the Jewish people who are subjugated in their own country, they're a defeated people. And I want you to know that Jesus came for the despised. Jesus came for those people who are just so self-absorbed in their own life, in their own agenda. And I want you to kind of think of that for a moment. That every culture and every generation has always had some sense of me, myself, and I, right? Life is about me, myself, and I. Some of us live that, gen some of us live that individually. Some of us live that in our own culture. Some of us think of that of our own nation. We're the best. We're the best country in the world. We got the best government. We got the best leaders. We got the best army. We got the best, 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 best. And everybody else are little peons. And we have a tendency to look down and despise other people, other cultures, because they live in different parts of the world, because they look different from us, they have different skin color or tone, they dress differently, they talk differently, they act differently, they eat different food. And when we look down, we are, in all technicality, despising them. Jesus came so that you and I would know that he came to make room for the despised. See, you and I have a tendency to put up walls, that, to put up all kinds of barriers to think that, oh, you know, well, because I have money and you don't, you're, you know, you're, you're lesser than me, or I'm educated and you're not educated. Oh, I, I have a big house and you have a small house. And we're constantly measuring each other by the clothes we wear, by how much money our jewelry or things that we have. And in all intents and purposes, we despise. And then somehow we justify ourselves. Let me tell you, if you don't think this is an absolute world-changing principle, we have fought world wars over this issue. Where one nation rises up against another nation, they feel they're the superior race. They believe because they have more people than you're, then ultimately that you're nothing. You come from a little island, you come from a little country, you're poor, you're, you know, whatever. And we despise one another. And Jesus came to tear that barrier down. And he says, no. Jesus came to spend time and make room for the despised. And if Jesus makes room to hang out with the despised, to hang out with the Zacchaeuses, to hang out with the Matthews, to hang out with lepers, and to touch them. How can you and I do any different if we're saying that we're Christ followers and disciples? See, this is what we get from Jesus' birth. Jesus came down, he spent time with us, he came for the despised, and then I think the beautiful picture and how Jesus breaks these walls in a practical sense is that it reminds you and me that Jesus is like us. What do I mean by that? 
What I mean by that, that Jesus is like us, that the fact that here's God, this is, this is where the unbelieving world usually comes, and it's one of their attacks and says, well, I mean, God coming into flesh? I mean, aren't you confused? Is he God or is he a man? I mean, like, pick one, all right? So what you used to get when I was in New York. Pick one. I'm like, well, I don't have to pick one. He's both. Why? Because he's God. I can't be both, but he's both. And this is the implication of that. The implication of that is that ultimately that you and I do not say, do not serve and love and adore a God who is immune from evil and suffering and injustice in the world. Think about that for a moment. That the God of the universe is not standing on his throne and looking down at all you little peons and all this universe and saying, well, if you work hard enough, if you sacrifice, if you beat yourself enough, if you show yourself faithful enough, maybe I'll let you come and spend time with me. No. He's not a God, and that's what makes him the God above all other gods, because every other deity, every other God that you would see out in the world basically tells you you've got to work hard enough, live long enough, do this, and go through these rituals, and go through these ceremonies, and go through these traditions, and if somehow at the end you'll, 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 you'll make it, then you might be acceptable. Well, Jesus is greater than all that religion, because Jesus did, Jesus it was not a man. This is what most thing is. Most people say, well, how does a man become God? Well, I would say that you're looking at it from the reverse end. It's not that man became God. That's an, that is not, it's the reverse. It's that God, the deity of God, God himself added to his own deity humanity. He added to himself. Why did he add him to himself? So that you and I would have a God who would never leave us or forsake us, that you and I would not have a high priest who did not experience the same evil, the same injustice, the same brutality that the world could offer. Now, I I can't explain from the mere 66 books that we have here. I'm sure when I get to heaven, he'll tell me all the whys, you know, and I'll email you back, but until then... (laughs) We're just going to have to understand that if there's evil and suffering and injustice in the world, yeah, I, I don't really know all the whys and why it's here and why is it allowed and all this, but this is what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that our God doesn't love you and care for you because he came and he endured the same pain and the same injustice and the same evil. And he is a God who did not make himself immune from any of that. Matter of fact, what we see is that he immersed himself. He immersed himself into that. He immersed himself. Think about this way. Do you realize that Jesus wasn't born in a palace? Where was he born? It says here, in a manger. What's a manger? Well, a manger is a barn. Now, I'm from Brooklyn. We don't have barns in Brooklyn. We got garages. Does that count? Like car garages, grease, and you, go, you ever go to you know, a car shop? I mean, it's just grease everywhere, and they're just dirty, you know. It's, you wear, don't wear white. It's just not going to happen. Okay. It's the same thing with a manger, same thing with a barn. Okay, there's animals, and there's dung, and there's filth, and... Jesus is born, not in a palace, but he's born in a dirty, filthy barn, fit for beasts. I love the fact that um, this is how Jesus is like us. He didn't come with any special privilege. He was sitting in all his glory and all his majesty, and he laid that all down. He laid his glory and his majesty down and he was born humbly in a barn, not in a palace fit for kings. He who was rich laid all his wealth, he laid it all down and he became poor on your behalf and our behalf. Why? 
because he's making time to be with you. He took upon his, himself humanity now as part of his deity. And I think, what, I think that what that communicates more than anything else is how much people matter a great deal to God. And that's why they should matter to you and me. And that's why when we look at the first, second, third century, as they exploded, and they, this small little band of group, they had no political, social, economic influence in any shape or form. They were under persecution. They were being, they were, their, their property was being taken. They were being put up on stakes. Nero was burning them at the stake. He was feeding them to lions. And this this small little group who had no influence, no power, they took the gospel and they became the most influential people on the planet within the first century. Now, that's impossible. But what's impossible for men is possible with God. And, th- and then when you look at the historical record, not only what the scripture says, but you look at the historical documents from different cultures that, that, are, that are in libraries and institutes, you're going to see how Christianity had a massive influence in the culture, in society. And then what you're going to see is a letter written by a Roman emperor himself, Julian Domitian, who tried, he was the last pagan Roman emperor, and he wanted to wipe out Christianity around the 3rd century. And there is a historical document, it's in, it's, in the, it's in a library, you can go on Google and, and uh, pull it up if you want. And in this letter, he writes, frustrated, to one of his counselors, and he says, the whole weight of the whole Roman Empire, I mean, they had tanks, and they had missiles, and they had satellite, and you know, whatever. I mean, they had all the military power today, the and they couldn't wipe out a small little group of people that had no political, social, economic influence at all. They must have, these people must have been shielded by a great power. They must have been serving a great king. They, they, they must have had resources that this world have never seen or known to be able to survive that. And they did. And he writes in this letter and he says... He writes to his friend, he goes, these, these impudent Galileans... I can't get rid of them because they not only take care of their own poor, they take care of our poor too. And they become the actual living letter of God to an unbelieving world who hates them and spits at them and nails them to a cross. And my friends, that, that, that is not weakness. That is power from heaven. And because of that, they turned the whole world upside down. Jesus came to make room for the despised. Uh, look at verse, uh, jump with me to verse 4. Let's look at another, another grouping of people. Verse 4, so Joseph also went up. So there's Joseph. Uh, the end of, uh, middle, uh, middle of verse 5, it says he went, uh, he went there to register with Mary. Okay, so you have... You have Caesar Augustus, Quinarius, okay, absolutely the spies. Now you have Joseph and Mary, okay, and, P- and, and Jesus came to make room for the poor. Joseph and Mary were the poor of poor. I mean, they couldn't even provide diapers for Jesus. They had no room. They're homeless, penniless, on the road. And the reason why we're absolutely convinced that they, were absolutely, they didn't have like, like a, you know, a Roth IRA somewhere, you know what I mean, or you know, a, a, a vacation home stashed away, or you know, some money under, under, the, under their bed somewhere. There, there, there wasn't any, any you know, inheritance, you know, stock market funds, anything that they had. There's nothing they could tap into. Because if you read the book, you're going to find out that when, every year they were required to go all the, every, every faithful Jewish man, woman, and child were, every year had to go back to Jerusalem and they were to offer a sacrifice for their sins. And, and what was an acceptable offering, okay, was a bull or, or a goat or a sheep. And, and usually if you were rich, you offer a bull. I mean, if, if you were like middle class, you, you know, you, you offered a, a, you know, a goat. If, 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 if you, you know, you were kind of lower middle class, you'd offer a baby, 
you know, a baby sheep. But if you were dirt poor and you couldn't afford the, the bull, you couldn't afford the goat, you couldn't afford the sheep, you'd offer little doves. And every time you read the scriptures, Mary and Joseph offered what? Doves. Because they were just that dirt poor. Jesus came to make room. And I, this is what ends up happening to you and me at times that not only that sometimes we get so self-absorbed and we tend to despise others, but sometimes we get so busy in life. We're, we're so, we, we, have, we have put in our calendars 36 hours worth of stuff to do in a 24-hour day. And you know what that ends up doing to us? That makes us callous. It makes us so callous that all of a sudden now, when we look at the poor, when we look at the hurting, when we get that phone call, oh, I don't want to be bothered, I got no time for this, and we tend to shut people off. And we have no time. And we're so busy going after the American dream. We're so busy running after a whole bunch of... I'm guilty. I am just so guilty. Back in the day, Norm and I, we, we, we were working our tails off. I had my full-time job with the NYPD. I had my military drills on the weekend. I was a sergeant in the Army Reserve. I had a part-time job working security... Wife, three kids, mortgage. Norma was working a full-time job, and then she took another side job. We were making over six figures a year 25 years ago and broke. Why? Well, we had $40,000 in credit card debt. We had over $800,000 in mortgage debt. We had car loans and student loans and the evil consolidation loans. No, mm. oh, just consolidate, get a, get, get a second mortgage in your house, lower those credit cards down. In of itself, not bad. In of itself, not bad. But see, the problem is you don't put in your human condition. See, normally we get these consolidation loans, and oh, my credit cards are all clean. Guess what I do? Charge! Right? <laughs> don't do that. Very bad, okay? And so I am working 60, 70, 80 hours a week. I'm working three jobs, and I can't make enough money to pay all the debt. I got a beautiful house. The only reason why I even go there is to sleep. My marriage is falling apart. I got no relation with my children. And I definitely got no time for you. I'm busy. And so I harden my heart and I'm callous. And I can't even think of anybody else's problems because all I can think about is me, myself, and I and my stuff. And let me just say that, uh, which I said it to myself all the time. Well, hey, that's, you know, I'm, I'm in these, I, I'd even blame it on God. Well, God put me in this situation. Now, did God really put me in that situation? Or did I make choices and choices? Did I need five TVs? And five, anybody know what a VCR is? VCR? Okay, five, five VCRs. Beta? Anybody know what a beta is? A track. Okay? Stacks and stacks of A track. Did I need all that? Did I need two cars and a motorcycle? Did I, you know, need all the stuff? I mean, golly, l listen, people. Our closets are packed, okay? Our garages are so full, we can't even put our cars in there. We have to get a big old 20-foot shed in the back because we need room. That's still not enough because now we're going out and we're renting storage, <laughs> storage rooms for more stuff. Air conditioned, no less. We don't want anything bad. And we never go in there. Our poor children, they got to dig through all that stuff when we're gone. What a burden do we throw on them? We got stuff so stuck in our closet, we don't even know it's there. It's been there since Nixon was president. It's crazy. It's absolutely insane.
And this is where, if Jesus is like us, that he enters into our world, Jesus is also unlike us. And what do I mean by that? Well, Jesus is unlike us because he never sinned. Jesus is unlike us because when he was tempted, when he was, when the devil came and told him, listen, I'll give you all these kingdoms, turn that, turn that rock into, into bread and such and such. Jesus did not in any shape or form. What he did was he chose the will of the Father over himself. He chose that ultimately that he was not going to allow any temptation in the world to take him. And that's why he did not sin. Us, on the other hand, we have this tendency, and you know, it's easy to use, and there's a whole bunch of other reasons. I mean, there's, you got, we have addictions, and we got hurts and habits and hang-ups and all kinds of stuff like that. I like using <clears throat> you know, uh, uh, possessions and wealth because they're so easy to pick out. You know, and so we have, you know, when, when a temptation comes along, every time we walk into Walmart and Home Depot and, you know, and Lowe's and, you know, Hobby Lobby, you know, or whatever, you and I didn't even know we needed it until we walked in there and saw it. <laughs> oh, got to get that, got to get that, got to get this, got to get, ooh, look at that, look at that barbecue. I need that barbecue. It has lights on it. Mine don't have lights. <laughs> I did that. I did that. I'm guilty, you know. Don't, I don't go shopping. I got no control. <laughs> but I know. And so when temptation comes, I don't, I'm, I, I, Father, should I make this purchase? That usually comes after I'm crying, God, I'm in debt, help me. You know? And he's like, sell your stuff, move into a smaller house. And we go, no, no, won't do that. See, Jesus came when he came. This is why we can run to Jesus. Because unlike us, when we run to him with our problems, he says, yeah, I was tempted like that too. I was tempted with the kingdoms of the world. But I went back to my father. I said, Father, if it's not your will, it's not his will. The kings of the, the world belong to him, not to you, not to anyone else, to him. And he gives them out according to his riches and glory. And that's why Jesus came. Look at um, verse 3. It says, and, anyone, and everyone went to his own town. And at the end there, in verse 7, it says that there was no room for them in the inn. And here's a third category of people. Everyone. Everyone in the inn. Jesus came for the lost. He came for those who are either too busy, too indifferent, we're too self-absorbed to make any room for Jesus in our life, in our circumstance, in our decision-making. We're too busy. I got stuff to do. And then we're lost. Because, my friends, what ends up happening is that you and I have this tendency to live our lives for trifles. We live our lives for meaningless things. We work, we sweat, we bleed, we sacrifice. And then at the end of our life, you and I think that, oh, I, I, I can end my life knowing I finally got that granite countertop. Oh, oh, those mahogany cabinets, I finally got them. Yes. Life is so meaningful now for me. Nobody. And over the hundred plus hospital visits that I've made, of people going to the end of their life have ever, ever asked me, Eddie, oh, could you please go home? I just want to look at my financial statement one more time and rub it. Oh, just, Eddie, could you just go home? And I, I want you to take that, 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 that award, that degree, I want you to bring it over because I want to hold it as I go into glory. No. This is what I've heard over 100 plus times. Can you call my mom? Can you call my wife? Can you call my kids? And all of a sudden, clarity of life 
hits us and we realize that life, if you're going to make an eternal impact, is because people matter. And too many of us have squandered years and decades over trifles. And I'm not saying they're bad. Granite counter cops are not evil. Mahogany, if you have money to buy them, buy them by the grace of God. Invite me to go look. I'll even rub them too. <laughs> but to spend your entire life to sacrifice, to violate another human being, to make no room for our spouses, our children, our neighbors, our co-workers, because we have so filled our calendar with 36 hours worth of stuff that we have no room for people, which means that we have no room for God. We have no room to gather into his presence. We have no room to gather as a community of faith. We have no room, no time to pray. We rush in here and we rush out. Done. I did it. Check. Made my thing for God. I'm like, oh, please. May you be delivered in the name of Jesus from rushing. In New York, we call that hurry sickness. And just because you live in Florida does not mean you don't have hurry sickness. People are rushing around. There is so, I, I think there's more stuff to do here than there is in New York. That's because we can't afford it in New York. Rent is like $3 billion. <laughs> Nobody can afford to go out to a restaurant. Here, every restaurant that opens up, we're running there, running there. There's a show, there's Disney, and, you know, and there's all kinds of stuff going on. And we're running and running and running and running and vacations and scuba diving and seeing the crocodiles and rubbing the panthers or the bobcats. I don't know what we do, whatever. None of them is bad stuff. And we're so busy. We have no time to pray. We have no time to read his word. We have no time to slow down our life to be still before a holy God. We make no room for him. And then we're bitter, and we're angry, and we're nitpicking. And our relationships suffer. That's not how God created you and me to live. God created us to live for something else. And this is where I think it's, what ends up happening is that this is where you and I become very indifferent. For some of us, we have, I, I don't particularly have this tendency. I'm, I'm on the flip side of that pendulum. But there are just too many of us who are procrastinating. One day when my life gets better, when my finances work out, when my relationships are okay, when, when the sun and the moon line up, this and the other thing, then I'm going to serve, then I'm going to get involved, then I'm going to pray, then I'm going to do whatever. And we procrastinate, we push it off, push it off, push it off, push it off. And I tell you, my friends, you're going to end up like many people that I've experienced in my own life, in the hospital at the end of their life, going, ooh, what if? And wondering why they're alone in the hospital and no one's visiting them except the priest to say bye-bye. Instead of having a huge family of people who are there holding your hand, loving on you, and telling you, not goodbye, see you later. And with great joy, we're ushered into the presence of God. I tell you, there ain't anything more precious. And this is why Jesus came. Jesus came to be like us. Jesus came not to be like us, and Jesus came to make us like him. What I mean by that is that ultimately that we would realize that all that we're doing and all that we're saying, the accumulation of our life, is heading to Jesus to do the final outcome, that he is coming to renew our minds and renew our hearts, that he came to show us that he's making time for us so that we would not squander our life and live for trifles. And this is why we come to communion. Communion reminds us that it's all about Jesus. It reminds us where our time and our energy should go. It reminds us that ultimately 
You and I have a God who cares and loves us. You and I have a God who makes room. And he's saying that the deepest joy and the greatest purpose in your life, that the greatest way to experience the things of God and to experience this life, he gave us this life as a gift. It's not for us to run away and hide. It's not enough for us to say, oh, no, no, see, to be like Jesus is to say that, okay, I'm going to follow what Jesus did. Jesus didn't immune himself from the evil and the suffering of the world and the injustice. He immersed himself. He walked into people's brokenness. He walked into their sickness. He walked into their pain. He walked into their terrible neighborhoods, drugs and gangs or whatever. He walked in there and he showed mercy and he showed compassion and he loved them and he provided and he healed every sickness and he saved them and rescued them. And he's saying for those of us who are going to follow the way of our master, not religion, not rules and rituals and traditions, and regulations. He didn't come for that. He came for you, for people. The church is us. Gathering. It's not concrete block and shingle. This is nothing. It's building. The only thing that's holy in this room is you because of the presence of God in you. Not in cloth and material and carpet. I'm not saying that this isn't an important place. God has vessels that he uses for important things and he uses vessels for dirty things. This is a vessel he's using for a clean thing. But the holiness of it, the separateness, the sacredness of it is God's presence in you. You and I becoming a people of God's presence. Pursuing him, holding on to him, loving him. And I pray that you would discover that in deeper and more profound ways. And that's why he's, he came. And he's saying, listen, if you're going to be radical understanding that my birth came for a reason. God's on a mission, and that mission is to rescue, and he's given you and me that same mission, to go home and to radically love our spouses, to radically love our children, to radically love our brothers and sisters, our aunts and uncles, to radically love our neighbors and our co-workers, to love Matter of fact, when you think of all the things that you could be known for, the one thing the scripture says is is probably the most important thing, that the world will know that you are my disciples by how much money you have in the bank account, by how big your house is, how many degrees you have, by how deeply you love. And my friends... This is why Jesus came to make room for the despised. He came to make room for the poor. He came to make room for the lost. And in doing so, Jesus became like us. Jesus became not like us. And Jesus came to make us like him. Let's all stand. I want to invite everyone in the hearing of my voice if you are worn out and exhausted and your life is so frantic, I'm going to invite you in the name of God. God would have me tell you that you don't have to carry that heavy burden and that heavy yoke. That, heavy yoke. that God's yoke is light and easy and he wants you to be free. And he wants to bring healing in your life. And he wants to bring deliverance in your life. And he wants to break bondages in your life. And he invites you to his table. Because his body was broken and his blood was shed for your freedom and your rescue and mine. That his life came with a divine purpose to set the world free. And that to tear down every barrier that would hinder us that would make us feel superior, that would make us be indifferent, that would think that we're special of some sort beyond us 
hurting someone else, and he tears it all down. He says, follow the way. And if that is where your heart is, then he invites you to come. And we're going to close with this song. As the song is being played, come up, take the communion elements, and hold on to them. But if you're saying, Eddie, I don't know about this Jesus thing yet, I'm not ready, whatever, then I would tell you, just don't come up and take communion. It would just be a dead, meaningless thing for you. We're going to love you whether you take communion or not. But that's what God's asked us to do. Because people are very, very important to God, and that's why they are to us too. So let's close with this song. Feel it come forward, and then I'll close in prayer. In this time of desperation When all we know is doubt and fear There is only one foundation We believe We believe stand before a holy and righteous and perfect God who is not immune from the evil and suffering and injustice that our sin, our rebellion, our disobedience 
has produced an abundance. He doesn't despise us because of our sin. He doesn't despise us for our brokenness. He doesn't despise us for our rebellion. He's not indifferent because we're poor and naked and wretched. He's not indifferent to the pain and the hurt and the sickness and the sorrow that you and I go through. He loves you and me so much that he stepped out of eternity onto earth, born in a filthy manger, not into a palace fit for kings. He gave up his glory. He laid down his glory. He laid down his wealth. He laid that all down so that you could have life and life abundantly. And his birth ushered in the fulfillment of God's ultimate promise to you and to me that he entered the world not only to experience it, but to one day, because of his body being broken and his blood being shed, that he's going to wipe away all evil, all injustice, and all suffering, that there's going to be a day, our great hope, that you and I will stand and there'll be no more tears and no more pain and no more suffering and we will stand before a holy God, perfect. And that's why we come. And that's why we take his body together and his blood together. Father, I thank you, Lord, for every single person here. I pray, Father, that as we leave this place, Father, that we would realize our sanctified purpose, that we are a people of your presence. And when we walk into a room, we bring your presence. We walk into our job place, we bring your presence. When we walk in, Father, to, to a store, when we go on vacation, when, Father, we, we, we give and we serve and we use our gift, we bring your presence. We are people of your presence. And I pray, Father, that that is exactly why Jesus' birth came, so that we would be a people of your presence. And I thank you, Lord, for every single person here. I thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in us in 2016. And we're looking forward to more of you in Jesus' mighty name. God bless you. Have a wonderful and awesome day.